and you get into trouble because you are free and you have opportunities. It's very safe if you don't have any freedom and if you have no opportunities. A prisoner is safe. Uh, some people say that Chota Rajan has decided to come back because he'll be safe in prison. <laughs> well, he'll be safe as long as he lives. So this is, you know, I, have, I don't have time to develop all of these. I'll only put some markers, some issues will be flagged. You, you can keep them in the back of your minds. And then interactions can follow. The second thing I want to say is this. First I said there is an ambivalence about your youth. The second is there is a profound ambivalence about this age, the age in which you live. And um, this age, this is an age of the young. The Indian society is becoming younger. When I look at my faculty in St. Stephen's College, it's becoming younger. Not only that, it's a youth that is flashed everywhere. So this is the age of the youth. At the same time, in no other century, in no other period in human history, were young people exposed to such risks and dangers. HIV AIDS, for example, is a symbol if you see a man, 20 year old young man, who is a victim of HIV AIDS, you look at least 70. And it is an infection, it is an epidemic that is programmed to attack only young people. The people who are vulnerable to HIV AIDS is in the age group of 17 to 14, the prime of your life. So that's also very characteristic of this age. Addiction, for example, substance abuse. Suicide, about 1.5 lakh, 150,000 people are committing suicide in this country according to the National Crime Bureau records and an overwhelming majority of them are very young people. Depression, young people. Desperation, young people. Terrorism, young people. Whichever way you look at it. Youth is a great peril today. These are things we have to understand. Now, <clears throat> the challenges that you are going to face, you are already facing them, many of them, and many more you will face, come from certain features of the age in which you live. They don't just drop from the sky. Count Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian author, used to say that between who we are and the world we have created, there is a terrible tension. He put it like this, between our conscience and our context, there is a terrible incompatibility. In other words, the world we have created voluntarily, deliberately, with a lot of hard work and good intentions, is such that we are not able to live in comfort, in peace, in self-respect and express what is the best in us within the system we have created for us. What we have created is hostile to us. You know the old story of Frankenstein. You create a Frankenstein and it's now trying to swallow you, just chasing you. So therefore, we have to understand some of the ingredients, some of the features of the world that is created by our species in order to understand the challenges that are facing us. Again, I'll deal with all of this in brief because, you know, time is not sufficient otherwise. The first thing that we have realized that we are living in a consumerist world. Now we think that consumerism is a great blessing because it enlarges the frontiers of our enjoyment. You can buy and enjoy whatever you want. You know, it's a world, it's a brave new world. 
of great possibilities, freedom, enjoyment. No, no one had it so good ever before. Well, this is the general impression. But there is a very grim face to this. Consumerism reduces you to a stomach. All that is important is what goes into your stomach. The human being is shrinking. What we need is stature, not money. Not only we need money, we need material resources, they are very important. But all these are utterly insufficient. You may have a mansion, but you may not have a home. You may be apparelled, draped in the most expensive clothes, 10 lakh suit for example, but you may be curling up in shame. You may not be able to respect yourself. You may not be able to face your own conscience. You look at these celebrities and you feel jealous of it. Walt Disney, who invented Mickey Mouse, was once asked by a journalist as to how he enjoyed his status of being a celebrity. He shot back. He said, celebrity? What do you mean? My being a celebrity does not make my wife respect me or my children or baby. My being a celebrity does not make my dog take me seriously. That's exactly what he said. Nor does it keep the ticks away from my dogs. These are all social illusions we have created. You should know the predicament of celebrities. Some of them committed, commit suicide. It doesn't help. So, in the consumerist world, one of the major issues is, and that's the problem we are facing, that you will be alienated from realities. Your only reality is the market. We tend to equate life with market. <coughs> and alienated from realities, we invent for ourselves a dream world. And in that dream world, we are only consumerists. And therefore, our value, our personal worth is measured in terms of what we own. Cell phone being smartphone. Cell phone will not go. Smartphone. Huh? Ah, smartphone. See, because individuals cannot be smart, they need smartphone. Thereafter, you are living inside the smartphone. So, it is not the case that you have a smartphone. It is the case that the smartphone has you. When I see young people all wired up with their both ears plugged in and listening to something in this and walking in the corridors, I feel like crying. What? Manifestation of life is this. They are totally cut off from the world around them. If a teacher comes from the other side, they won't be able to recognize. They are so alienated from realities. And I understand that that's how young people live, live at home also. There is no conversation at home. So many parents have with tears in their eyes told me, Sir, we wait for our children to come home. We start a conversation before, before we can complete the first sentence. My son, my da daughter gets up and walks away. Tears. There will be a flood of parental tears. There's a tragedy over which we are keeping the conspiracy of silence. 
what this is part of this consumerist world that we have created. Who cares for who? <clears throat> Another important problem in consumerism is that everything has to be instrumental value. Everything is an instrument, including parents, teachers. This is how we have all lost our authority. There was a time when teachers carried, commanded tremendous respect and authority. A teacher's word was the last word. Now also the teacher's is the last word. All traditional centers of authority have lost. Religious leaders have no authority. Political leaders have no authority. Teachers, parents have no authority. Who has authority? The policeman has authority because he wields a lati. He can crack your skull. The goons and gundas have authority because they can stick a knife into your stomach. Who else has authority? But that's not authority. That is terrorism. That's the problem. When nothing has intrinsic value and everything has only instrumental value, which is the creed in consumerism, this is bound to happen. So I believe that in the educational sector, we need to be a little more informed about these things. My dear friends, at this stage, perhaps you may not know the gravity of what I'm saying, but I tell you, that life is built on certain intangibles. Life is not made out of big dramatic events, small things, a kind word, a gentle touch, willingness to offer a cup of a glass of water, the willingness to hold somebody's hand in times of pain and say, when I'm with you. To walk 100 yards, visit somebody in times of sickness, or to help a fellow student who is not doing so well. Or to draw the attention of somebody about a, an opportunity that is coming up. Caring for others. Life goes on not because of these big leaders making a lot of noise pollution. Life goes on because ordinary people stick to their station and do their day-to-day -day routine work faithfully, like your mother does. But we have no appreciation for it. But you will know the heartbreak of your mother, not now, but when you become a mother with teenage children. The same experience, the same tragedy will be recycled. And it doesn't take long for victimizers to become victims. At this point in time, you do not know what you are doing. You think it's a smart thing, or as you say, a cool thing. A cool thing is a fool thing. So this is one part of the problem. I'm going to have many more aspects to this, but I have no time. Second thing uh, I want to say is that you know young people today are stuck and stammering in meaninglessness. What are we living for? What is it that you want to achieve in life? What are you running for? Have you ever asked yourself this question? The story of a champion dog that was an expert in catching rabbits. That was well known. Every animal in the forest was fond of watching this dog chase a rabbit and catch surely prey. One day as it chased the rabbit, the rabbit escaped. So the other animals had their opportunity. They came and they began to ridicule the champion dog. That is the rabbit. What happened? He said, well, I tell you the difference. I was running for my supper. The rabbit was running for its life. And that's, that's a big difference. It's a very, very, very big difference, really. You have to be sure, you have to be clear as to what you're running for. And that is a challenge. 
And if you're actually running for life, you may have to sometimes come to very unorthodox decisions. The problem in this age of consumerism is what I call the homogenization of life. The homogenization of society, the homogenization of desire. Everybody wants the same thing. And St. Stephen's is a major victim. Everybody wants to be in St. Stephen's College. You know, each year when I conduct admissions, I gain about 30,000 enemies. They're all powerful enemies. Because every mother, every father thinks that his or her son or daughter is a genius. And sure, no question about it. If a child gets 95%, I could never dream of 95%. But with 95% you cannot even get an interview call in such a way. He says, meaning is therapeutic. <clears throat> what a large number of patients need is not medicine, but meaning. Modern practice of medicine cannot give meaning. Doctors can only prescribe drugs, whereas the patient needs meaning. Uh, when my daughter finished her super specialization in nephrology about four years ago, she rang me up. She said, Dad, now what? <coughs> I've done whatever can be done in this country in terms of educational qualification. I've now become a doctor. What shall I do now? So I said, simple become a healer, not a doctor. I said, there are doctors and doctors and doctors. You don't have healers. And in my scheme of things, you're not a doctor if you're not a healer anyway. So, there is a dimension, there is a scope, there is a horizon to which we are becoming systemically blind, willfully blind. We don't have the courage even to look at it. Because if you look at it, our life will change. And we do not know how to cope with it. But you are going to need a lot of courage, my friends, in the days ahead. Otherwise, what will happen is, you'll end up in the same pit. As I said, this is an age of merciless, brutal conformity. You're being pressure squeezed into the same mold. But your destiny may be different from the destiny of somebody else then why are you squeezed into the same group? This whole entire age is so hostile to what is unique in the individual. This is an age par excellence of typification, of standardization, of homogenization. Everybody must look alike. Everybody must talk alike. Now, for example, if you listen to young people talking English, it's exactly the American accent. Everybody now has the same accent. My generation had no accent. Of course, we had the vernacular accent. When I first came to Delhi, people are, and I struggled to speak English because I was a product of Malayalam medium education. So I put my best foot forward and started speaking English. And people asked me, why don't you talk to us in English? I said, this is, this, this is my English. They thought, they thought I was speaking Malayalam. I was speaking my best English. When I learned English in standard four, the person who taught me English uh, stammered a bit. So I thought that was how English was spoken. <laughs> I never had the opportunity to hear English spoken anywhere. So initially I spoke English in a stammering fashion. I was corrected in the next class. That's how we have reached here. <clears throat> now everybody is like everybody else. How oh, disappointing. Now can you imagine a, 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 a garden with only one kind of flower? To the left there is rose, to the right there is rose, in front of you there is rose, behind you there is rose, underneath you there is rose. What kind of a life? And the same attitude it will also breed intolerance towards diversity. 
which is what what is now uh, happening. You see, you, it takes a lot of spiritual strength to tolerate diversity or to enjoy diversity. Homogenization is a materialistic product project. Celebration of diversity is a spiritual strength. If you look at creation, creation is established on the foundation of diversity. It is anti-life to be homogeneous. Homogenization is a death principle. You know, isn't it so marvelous that among the seven billion odd people on this earth, everyone's fingerprint is unique? That's the beauty of creation. But you are living in a society where each one of you is required to be a carbon copy of the other. You are required willingly to give up and renounce your uniqueness, to disown your unique and profound destiny. And you will be consigned to lifelong frustration and self-revulsion because you have surrendered. And standing up against is a challenge. And to say that I will not play this game, as I did, I walked out. I became a dropout at the age of 52. I felt that my life as a teacher in St. Stephen's College was becoming meaningless. I had come from the most economically deprived background. I had no bank balance, I had nothing. People thought not only that I had no bank balance, they thought I had lost my personal balance also. <laughs> but, but if I had not committed that madness at that time, I would not have been standing here before you. I would have been six feet underground. I would have died of frustration. I have died of self denigration. <laughs> You see, usually I, I, in my life as a public speaker, I know that when plenty of water is supplied, it is an internal request to stop. <laughs> okay, so let's now move on. The, the, the fourth problem that I want to flag again related to the spirit of this age is great poverty in our life. We are rich but extremely poor. And I sometimes say that there is a famine in the land. There is a famine. What kind of a famine is it? It is a relationship famine. You know, I travel extensively. I meet with people in all walks of life. And because I'm a priest, people confide in me. I don't know why people, uh, there's no reason that you should trust a priest more than you trust anybody else. <clears throat> I don't trust myself actually. <laughs> but people do confide in me. And in five minutes of conversation, it's, it's the skeletons start tumbling out. Nobody's happy. The richer, the higher a person, the more frustrated. Everybody is lonely. What does loneliness mean? It means that I cannot relate to anyone. I am all alone. In this planet teeming with people, in cities where people are rubbing shoulders with each other, not by choice but by necessity, in blocks where people live crowded together, everybody is lonely. I am alone. I am Now what achievement is this? I tell you something. The richness of life rests on relationships. Relationships are the banquet of life. And how have we ruined relationships? Because we have demolished the very foundation of relationship. Now what is the foundation of relationship? It is mutuality. Instead what we do now is, the modern philosophy, the reigning philosophy is that I will take everything and everyone only on my terms. If you are willing to accept my terms, then you can be with me, but I will use you. The mindset that insists on taking everybody on one's own terms is the brutal mindset that prescribes no limit to using anybody at will. That's why people end up in abusive relationships. 
millions of young people are languishing in abusive relationships. There is no love today. People are afraid of love. Now this also should be a management problem. What is management? Management is also relationship, isn't it? How do you as a manager relate to your employees? You please tell me. If you think that they are only instruments, they are only a, a pair of hands, you are not a good manager. I think the manager's first task is to give the, to the employees, the workers, a sense of self-respect. And a feeling that the work that they do is noticed and valued. That they matter to the system. So, management also stands on relationships. If you can't manage your own home, what will you manage? How many managers today, successful managers, are successful parents? Successful husbands, successful wives? I can't think of any. What management are we talking about? Of course, I mean, you can distort the word and say, management means man-agement man aging qualities. Huh? People grow old. Huh? I grow old, I grow old, I shall bear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. So, relationship. <clears throat> and finally, of course, let me also say this, this is an age of conspicuous waste. Waste. Now the wastes that we create, how many phones have you discarded, by the way? How many phones have you discovered? I mean, in the, the, the days of land phones, you used a phone for 30 years, if not more. Now, one year maximum. What happens to the other phone? Your dog is using it? How about it? You know, it's a, it's a tragedy. They, I, each phone costing 20,000 rupees, 30,000 rupees, 60,000 rupees. If this is not a crime, what is? Waste, conspicuous waste. How many sets of clothes do we need? Go and examine your wardrobe. Take a whole day to count your clothes. Examine your utensils or other accessories in the house. Find out if you use even 10% of what you have. How many books you have and how many of them have you read? Books are nowadays bought only as ornaments. It should be on the bookshelf. Conspicuous waste. Conspicuous waste means, in economics, it's a well-defined category, it means indulging in wasteful purchase and possession, ownership, in order to become noticed. That is conspicuous waste. Uh, Maruti, for example, brought out a car called esteem. That's psychology in it, because those who have no self-esteem, at least can have an esteem. <laughs> so, we are living in this age of conspicuous consumerism and it results in criminal waste. But each time you waste, you are wasting yourself. You know why? Because you are adding on to you pressures to earn more and more and more and more. You know, I said I walked out at the age of 52 and I started my career on a princely salary of 600 rupees a month. It took me more than 10 years to cross the thousand mark. So obviously when I resigned from St. Stephen's College, I really had no bank balance. Believe you me. But why did I have the courage to walk out into the uncertain? Because my needs were very limited. Three slices of bread in the morning, two chapatis for lunch, a little oats for supper. That I can't live on that. Why would I bend my knees before somebody? About five years ago, I was invited by an organization in Gujarat, in Ahmedabad, to address the industry. 
the richest industrialists in Gujarat. The speaker before me was Narayan Murthy. So I said, I asked myself, what shall I say to these people? And how shall I begin my speech? So I decided. I decided on my presentation style. There was a pair of trousers that I had inherited from my father. It's more than 60 years old. They're still in some condition. I decided to wear my trousers, or that, that pair of trousers. And very cheap clothes. So I, when I started my speech, I said, I would like you to do a little guesswork. I said, how old is my trousers? Somebody said three years, somebody said five years. I said, no, no, we'll take one more chance. Somebody said, maybe seven years. I said, why do a mark? And they said, how many? I said, 60. <laughs> so I said, I want you to know that I'm not my clothes. Their programs last only one hour. And it just said, my interactions with them lasted three hours. And then one of them said, with a lot of embarrassment, he said, Sir, just two weeks ago we chartered a flight from Ahmedabad to go to Singapore to buy some coffee mugs. <laughs> Now we are feeling very embarrassed about it after listening to you. What should we do with the coffee cups? I said, donate it to St. Stephen's College. <laughs> but I must tell you that they did not donate a single cup. <laughs> That's why that is why they are rich and St. Stephen's is poor. Anyway, so in the midst of all this, I think the most significant challenge that you face, and I face, and all of us face, is to lead a meaningful and, among this word, happy life. Have you ever heard the word happiness uttered in recent times? No. At least, I'm, see, I'm a student of literature. I watch things very carefully, whatever happens on the linguistic front. Read newspapers, read magazines, read the literature that's being produced. The word happy does not exist. It's a very significant index to where we are headed. So, uh, it's a great challenge to lead a happy life, a meaningful life. Now, to do that, you must know the difference between life and the means for life. Today, we confuse the accessories, the instruments, the resources, the means for life as life. Or the means are more important than ends. How can the house you live in be more important than your personality? You please tell me. How can the uh, quality of the television set you have be more important than the quality of your relationship with your wife or daughter or son? How can that be? Please tell me. If you're not, if you're not able to live in peace, sitting on 2,000 crores, what is that worth? There's a story of a man who used to cheat the income tax department and he used to live in fear of being caught one day. So it affected his sleep, he couldn't sleep. In his bed he would be turning and tossing, wondering when he would be arrested. So one day he decided to have done with it and solve his problem. So he took his checkbook, wrote out a check for 10,000 rupees and wrote a letter to the income tax commissioner saying, uh, I, am, uh, I am sorry that I have cheated the department. So I am sending this check, please accept it just so that I can sleep better. Uh, then the next sentence says, uh, if uh, still I cannot sleep, I will pay the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the use in, in, in holding everything? If end of the day all you gain is worry, grey hair, sleepless nights, wrinkles on your faces and 
content on the faces of your children. I tell you one thing. You can consider yourself to be a successful person if in the evening of your life you command respect from your own children. compromise the integrity of life, if you violate and corrupt its purity, if you undermine its dignity and nobility, for the sake of material gains, you will be punished through your own children. They will hold you in utter contempt. And that's a serious problem. The greatest challenge that we know is the challenge to live, not the challenge to earn. Live, but that's not enough. Celebrate life. Celebrate life. Life is a celebration, not a burden. Many people ask me, you know, a colleague of mine came to my office a few months ago and he said, you know, he's just 51. He says, you know, we have all given up. How can you go on like this? <laughs> he said, given up? On life? How can you? There's a, there's a Malayalam song uh, which says, you know, it describes the beauty of Kerala. And then it ends up in a prayer saying, uh, will you give me a, one, one more boon? And that boon is one blessing and that is to come back to this place once more. Morning. No, we will not come back. Of course, I mean, in Hinduism there is the idea of rebirth, but you will not come back as the same person. That's the only opportunity. Live it well. Live it well. Do not sacrifice it at the altar of foolishness. So, now I'm going to give you a few principles very quickly. I know my time is up, so I'm not going to explain it. I'm going to, for the first time in my life, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to enunciate certain principles. One, life is the ultimate value. Second principle, material sources matter, but only as means, not as ends. And the confusion must end. Third, I am incomplete without the other. Because modern uh, life, the present age, is built on the idea of the self-contained autonomous individual. The greatest nonsense human brain has ever invented is this. It's typically an American contribution. That every individual is autonomous and self-sufficient. No individual is self-sufficient. No individual is autonomous. Life is built on the unchanging principle of interdependence and reciprocity. Breath, for example, what does breath mean? That I'm dependent on the world around. If you're autonomous, shut your, shut your nose and live for the next uh, two and a half minutes. That's all, that's autonomy. Don't ever think that you're complete. It's a great thing to say, I need you. My life is incomplete without you. That's the beauty of life. And that is also an important principle in management. But you do the hermeneutics yourself. And um, without the other, my life cannot be fruitful. Fruit is always for the other. Fruit is what connects nature with us. Fruit is the lovely, nourishing statement made silently by nature saying, I am incomplete without you. So, third principle. We are only as great as the purpose we live for. You live for peanuts, you become monkeys. Okay? Next. We must refuse to think 
refuse to conform unthinkingly. I talked about it. This is an age of conformity, enforced conformity. You are not given the freedom to cut your own paths. You simply and you eagerly conform. Think for yourself. Refuse to be a slave. Celebrate life. Come into the fullness of your own being. Next, overcome the spirit of alienation. We are continuous with the rest of creation. You know, in the cities, as we grow up, we get completely alienated from nature. And because we are alienated from nature, we are also denatured. Human nature gets distorted and corrupted simply because of its alienation from nature. You walk in the forest, you know that there is a spirit pervading the forest. In a clean night, clear night, you look at the stars. You know, in the little nursery rhymes, twinkle, twinkle, little star. It contains a wonderful insight that there is a connection between you and the star. The star is taking note of you. It's twinkling for your sake. It's actually winking at you. You know, you hold a camera to a distant star and you get a photograph. And what does it mean? Even between the inanimate object, both the camera and the distant object of the star, there is some kind of a response. That's what life is. Always sense your continuity with the rest of creation. It's a beautiful thing. And um, maybe finally, I'll cut short. Finally, please remember in your practice of management, people matter. Profit comes a distant third. The latest thinking on management, including in the United States, the slogan is people, planet, profit. Uh, profit. Can you remember? People, planet, profit. That's a priority. People, planet, profit. People matter. And if you care for people, you will certainly care for planet. And if you care for people and planet, profit is taken care of. You cannot destroy the planet and thrive. You cannot exploit your fellow human beings and thrive. Love them, take care of them. Every human being has the same pain, the same hope, the same love, the same fear, the same responsibility as you have, the same value. Take care of them. We love you. And there is no better management than management built on love. Well, I'll stop here and uh, I thank you very much for your patient listening. It's been wonderful.